Much love and respect, everybody. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for uh, tuning in again. Appreciate all you guys taking the time to go over the videos and over the information that I present. You could be somewhere else, you know, being entertained, but you decide to make the time to come learn and, and maybe see some information you haven't seen before and or to help with your research. So much love and respect to you. Much love to all the real people out there showing real support. Much love to my patrons. Thank you for keeping me afloat. I really appreciate you guys. And all the people who send me information to help with the research. Thank you once again. Pura vida, all right? Pura vida, pure life. Yeah, so this is uh, part five of this series. Make sure to catch parts one, two, three, and four if you haven't. Again, this is a part five of this specific series where we're reading old newspaper clips uh, amazing reports that they never showed us a lot of stuff that's very controversial as some would say unorthodox and not part of our school curriculums not considered part of history a lot of it now before we begin as for all the new people out there or anybody watching my channel for the first time here we've already established america's a true old world we've debunked the out of africa theories We've been here about five to six years, over 300 presentations, which do include a lot of historical sources, primary sources, archaeology, anthropology, and many more things that you can verify on your own. So on this particular series, again, we're reading these newspapers. We're just going over the information that has been gathered by a good brother. Uh, on Twitter, we're going to show uh, the name of the brother. So don't assume we don't actually show sources just because you're here for the first time. And for all those that have been here along the journey, hope you enjoy this uh, part. So let's get started. We're going to get into uh, this book first. Before we read any newspaper articles, I like to read a couple of the books too that we have here in our collection or in my collection. Pretty interesting stuff since we're talking about things that have been already found here that don't fit the narratives, you know, that don't fit their manifest destiny their school curriculums, their official history. This book is called Unearthed in Ancient America, The Lost Sagas of Conquerors, Castaways, and Scoundrels. This is written by Frank Joseph. So we continue on chapter one of this uh, book. We already read a part of chapter one. In the previous parts, this one right here says, Medallion puts Buddhists in Michigan a thousand years ago. By Frank Joseph. In 1983, James Schertz, professor of environmental studies and civil engineering at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, was shown a photograph taken by Dr. Pat Carmody in La Anse, Michigan, of an unusual medallion about 1.75 inches in diameter. It had been found some two feet beneath the surface 55 years before by a man digging foundations for a building on the Lake Superior Island of Iso Royale near Canadian order. The observed side of the object represented a man 
or statue seated in the entrance of a pyramid flanked on either side by palm trees before an audience of observers. The perimeter of the object was surrounded by 79 dimples. A hole pierced, a hole pierced the medallion at its top, perhaps for a small chain to be passed through, allowing the coin-like item to be worn around the neck. You hear that? People wearing chains and necklaces. And this is the image they found here. Okay. As you guys can see the pyramid. Right? And this guy seated in the front. Now, I know they're going to be saying, as it says here, the scene depicted on this medallion places its manufacture in medieval India. What India? So this, a pyramid and palm trees. He's saying a pyramid and palm trees tells him that is medieval India. Um, but hold up. I just want to say something here. And you got to be logical. We have plenty of pyramids here that look like this. Okay. We have palm trees here. And if you look at the uh, paintings of the Maya walls, like in Bonham Park, you'll see that we have the same clothing on. Who is Buddha? Who are the Nagas? Again, from previous presentations, we've already established who the ancient Nagas really were. They were coming from the ancient America. Same people you call in the Maya. All right, so real quick. I say this because, you know, I have a video just want to go over here in case you guys haven't seen it. It's called Mayak First Land, Maya, mother of Guatama, La, the ancient Naga, Ramayana, architect of the gods. So real quick, it says here, this is Britannica.com, says Mahamaya, also called Maya, right? Who's the Maya? The mother of Guatama Buddha, the mother or motherland, the mother. Who's the mother? Maya. Okay, Maya. That's his mom. That was her name. Buddha's mom. Buddha, as you guys can see, his first name is Gautama. Guatemala. Just L add the L-A at the end. Guatemala. 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 And his mom is Maya. Same place. Another part of the video we're saying here. Another part of the video, reading a book here. The capital city of the Quetzals was established thereabouts in Guatemala. Guatama, Guatama, that's Buddha's first name. Guatama is a very old name of the Americas. Again, Guatama is a very old name of the Americas, one of the five landing places after the flood. Hence, Guatemala. Another part of the video here, we're reading another book. It says here, Balmiki and his beautiful epic, the Ramayana, which is said to have served as model to Homer's Iliad, tells us that the Mayas were mighty navigators, navigators whose ships traveled from the western to the eastern ocean, from the southern to the northern seas, in ages so remote that the sun had not yet risen above the horizon. That being likewise great warriors, they conquered the southern parts of Hindostan Peninsula and established themselves there. That being also learned architects. Remember who established pyramid building and all that? They built great cities and palaces. These Mayas became known in after times under the name of Danavas and are regarded by modern historians as aborigines of the country or Nagas. Who's the ancient Nagas? The Mayas or known as the Dan, Danavas, the Danites, huh? Danavas. Now that footnote I was talking about that the Mayas were known as the Danavans, they're telling you because in the Ramayana in volume 2, if you guys don't know what the Ramayana is, make sure to look it up. We go over it in this video. In volume 2, this is from Balmiki, very historical, important source for uh, India. It says, in olden times, there was a prince of the Danavans, a learned magician endowed with great power. His name was Maya. It was he who by magic art constructed this golden grotto. He was the Vikamarkama, architect of the gods, of the principal Danavas, and this superb palace of solid gold is the work of his hands. Okay, he was Maya. All right, so make sure to get all this video. All right, it's not too long, 17 minutes, if you haven't checked it out. Pretty good. Let's go back to the uh, book. So again, we got to dodge the hijack. When they're saying right here, right, they found a coin with a Buddha on it, and their only proof that it's from India is just because they see the guy dressed like that, honestly, and sitting down like that. Like, like we didn't dress like that, like we didn't sit down like that. We did. All right, again, pyramids. Yeah, we find 
We find hundreds and hundreds of pyramids like this over here. And we got plenty of palm trees. So that's the Haja. Again, they found this in Michigan. All right, let's continue. This is the back part of the coin. All right, so let me go back. This is the front part of the coin. And this is the back part. So it's reverse of the Michigan medallion or medallion, right? It's, you can wear it on the chain. The reverse feature, the image of a radiant lion. It has a lion, a radiant lion, Judah, holding a scimitar in its right extended paw at the center of a heart with a wishbone surrounded by 69 dimples. In a space between these and another 79 dimples appeared the raised letters of, of two shirts, an unknown ancient script resembling Tibetan or Indonesian examples with which he had a passing acquaintance. All right, so they don't know the language, they just admit it, right? But they say it almost looks Tibetan or Indonesian was the origin. Continue says, he guessed that the medallion was produced by pouring some yellow metal alloy into a mold. Unfortunately, its metallurgic testing was not possible because the artifact had apparently vanished with its last known owner in 1986. All shirts had to go on was the photograph. It particularly intrigued him not only for its Asian imagery, but because of the circumstances of its discovery at an important place in the prehistory of North America. Around the turn of the fourth millennium BC, all right, we're talking about BC times. Listen, Isle Royale suddenly became the center of a colossal copper mining enterprise. This was in Michigan, ancient Michigan. They found this. We're going to do more and more videos on this. That came to just as abrupt a halt 2,800 years later. Okay. They found ancient copper mines in Michigan. Who was doing that? Who needed so much copper? From hundreds of pit mines stretching for some 50 miles across Michigan's Upper Peninsula, an unknown people excavated a minimum of a half a billion pounds of the world's highest grade of copper. All right, this is your copper that the so-called Greeks, Romans, the Etruscans, early Brits, and all these ancient people, this is where they were getting it from. The world's highest grade copper in the world. So, of course, they will come in here to get it. No less mysteriously, this enormous yield disappeared without a trace. The mines lay mostly dormant throughout the following centuries until they were reopened from AD 900 to AD 1300. Professor Schertz wondered if the strange medallion could have had something to do with Isle Royale's prehistoric miners, long suspected at least by unconventional investigators of overseas origins. And we continue waking up with analog we're in his twitter page right here we're gonna get some really good articles again make sure to follow the brother right here for all the hard work and research he does with these old newspapers american antiquities virginia 1818 it says here the following is a fair delineation of the stone fort an ancient curiosity of the west that has not until now been described about 40 miles from this extraordinary work, and about two and three miles from the town of Columbia, Maury County, Tennessee, a cave has been discovered containing a variety of earthenware, bricks of a form different from those of modern manufacture, and an iron sword resembling the saber of the old Persians or Scythians or Scythians, all right? See what they found here in Tennessee? The account is contained in a letter from William Donison, Esquire of Nashville, dated October 25, 1818, to Samuel L. Mitchell, Esquire of New York. And it says here, Sir, the following description of the stone fort is partly from my own observation and partly from information derived from Captain Thomas Eastland, who resided on that plantation called the Stone Fort Farm for several years. After the completion of the description and the diagram, it was shown to several individuals of intelligence who had visited the fort for the purpose of accurate examination and they individually concur in the correctness of this statement. I will not presume to suggest by what people such a fabric could be reared or in what age. At the first settlement of the state of Tennessee, the oldest Indians stated they had heard their father speak of it, but their earliest traditions had not traced its origin. Its description 
the stone fort is situated at the confluence of two of the most southern of the three forks of Duck River on the northwestern corner of Franklin County, Tennessee. The walls of this fort were originally composed entirely of stone. If ever the rock was cemented, time has destroyed it. At this time, the walls are covered with a coat of earth or turf, which during the process of time and the constantly recurring decay of vegetable matter for so many, perhaps centuries, has increased to the depth of one or two feet. On pulling down from its sides the turf, the stone fort stands completely veiled. At its northern extremity and in front of the walls are two conical pillars of stone about six feet high. All right, you see they're removing the dirt from the walls to see what they're saying. And they're finding pure stone. It's a, it's a temple, it's a building. And it even has two conical pillars in front of the wall about six feet high and at the base about 10 or 12 feet in diameter. In the rear of those pillars stands the northern wall extending from one branch of the river to the other. This wall meets each branch of the river at the foot of a fall of about 15 feet, the falls on either side being about the same descent. In the northern curtain of the wall is a gateway, which on this section of the fort is the only outlet. This wall on its inner face is about 10 feet perpendicular. In the rear of the gateway is a stone building of 16 feet square on the right of which is one of a similar description of about 10 feet square. Running south, the stone wall still maintains the same height until you arrive at the foot of the new falls, which are about 20 feet high. The falls on each branch of the river are nearly at the same distance from the upper falls and nearly of the same height on each branch at each fall. At these falls, the stone wall terminates in consequence of a bold rising bluff of limestone, through the center of which has been excavated a narrow pathway with steps to the river. All right, do you hear what they're finding in Tennessee? This sounds beautiful. Probably at the time it was, you know, built and people were living in it in ancient times. Temples with waterfalls all over it. You hear that? The like also occurs at the foot of the falls on the opposite side of the peninsula. In continuing south of this bluff, the stone wall is again resumed and continued to its most southwestern angle. From the most southwestern angle at right angles, the south curtain is continued from river to river. And this wall is also a gateway. The south wall on its inner side, about eight feet in height. The wall on the eastern side of the fort corresponds with that on the western as to the wall. As to the bluffs at the foot of the fall, the excavated passage and the continuance of the wall after passing the bluff to the most southeastern angle of the fort. On the south side of the south curtain of this fort, there is, at the base of the wall, a ditch of about 16 or 20 feet in width, extending from river to river. Here also appears to have been an immersed excavation. All right, and that's all we got, but that's very Amazing right here what they're finding. All right, in Tennessee, we continue waking up with analog. Says here, work of the Mount Builders. This is from 1890. A most remarkable find has been made on Jolly's Island at the mouth of the Hiawassee River in Tennessee. Hiawa, Hawa, Hiawassee, Hawa. The recent heavy rains and floods unearthed seven prehistoric statues on land belonging to J.H. French of Nashville. The figures show a well-developed knowledge of the art of sculpture in the mound builders or a race antedating them. In each case, the statues represent kneeling figures. One is unmistakably the figures of an Indian. Another is a Negro. Touch the hijack, you see how they're doing? The others being Mongolians. So they're showing phenotypes, what he's saying? Hmm, interesting. The attitude and expression evidently denote devotion and prayer to the deity. It is expected that these specimens will be sent to the Smithsonian Institution at Washington. Oh no, and that's why we never heard of these. It ended up with the Smithsonian Institute, you see? So a lot of people were doing this because they thought it was the right thing. They didn't know that the Smithsonian are the gatekeepers and they hide everything. They don't know what to really interpret when they find things like this, so anything they say is conjecture. But it's interesting to show, like we always said, America's a true old world. We had every phenotype here. 
Continue, we got a wonderful find. Tennessee, 1891. In a so-called Indian mound in Ross County, Ohio. Skeleton of a prehistoric chief unearthed. The tomb guarded by two huge stone panthers. The remains completely encased in copper armor. And the clothing studded with hundreds of pearls. All right, hundreds of pearls, beads, and other ornaments. Chillicote, Ohio, November 18th. The World's Fair Survey under the field assistants Warren K. Moorhead and Dr. H. G. Crescent, located at Anderson Station, Ross County, made a most remarkable discovery upon Mr. C. Hopewell's farm. The tumulus is 500 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 28 feet high. It lies in the center of a group of 26 mounds. All right, 26 mounds just in this place right here, all of which were opened in September and October. And they looted all these mounds, right? Hearing this? With good results. Oh, and they got good results. They stole everything. And they put it in museums and said it was coming from Egypt. On account of its great size, the mound was divided into five sections of 40 feet each for convenience and excavating. In the first cut made in the east end, nothing was found. Near the surface of the tumulus second cut, two boulder outlines resembling panther were uncovered and measured. Like the effigy mounds in Wisconsin, they were 80 to 90 feet long, being composed of one thickness of stone. One thickness of stone? The heads, limbs, and tails were distinctly outlined. Near the bottom of the second cut were three skeletons with objects of copper, bone, and shell. North of this deposit lay the great medicine man, or chief, of the village which had erected the mound. If the number of implements is evidence of the esteem in which a prehistoric man is held by his people, he was certainly the most important kaike or cacique, right, of the Ski Odo Valley, the chief. At this head were imitation elk horns, neatly made of wood and covered with sheet copper, rolled into cylindrical form over the prongs. The antlers were 22 inches high and 19 inches broad. At the top, they fitted into a crown of copper, bent to the head from, from I can't read that word, ecliptical I guess, to upper jaw. Copper plates were upon the breast and stomach, also on the back. The copper preserved the bones and a few of the sinews. It also preserved traces of cloth similar to coffee, similar to coffee, sacking in texture, interwoven among the threads of which were 900 beautiful pearl beads, 900 pearls. Oh yeah, they got they had good results, right? Bear teeth split and cut hundreds of other beads of both pearl and shell. Copper spool-shaped objects and other supplements covered the remains. A pipe of granite and a spearhead of agate were near the right shoulder. The pipe was of very fine workmanship and highly polished. At the side of the male skeleton was also found a female skeleton, the two being supposed to be man and wife. The mound is still in process of examination, two months being yet required to open it thoroughly. Mr. Moorhead stood guard all Saturday night over the find. It is thought to indicate connection with the Aztec people, the Mexica. You hear that? From Ohio to the Mexica. What's the origin story of the Mexica? As such, headdresses are only found in Mexico and Yucatan. More discoveries are anticipated soon. Do you hear what they're saying? He was dressed like a Mexica. Doesn't mean he was coming from Mexico. Could be the OG before they left. Before they took the exodus out of so-called Egypt. The Mississippi Valley. All right, this is a major drop right there. And they hit this. How come they don't have these in the museums, right? What happened? How come they don't respect these finds? And continuing this book is the lost history of ancient America. Our continent was shaped by conquerors, influencers, and other visitors from across the ocean by Frank Joseph. All right, this is a pretty cool cover he has. We go all the way to chapter 39. What does it say here? Ancient Chinese sword found in Georgia by John R. Haskell. During July 2014, an avocation surface collector chanced across a partially exposed sword mostly concealed behind roots protruding from the eroded bank of a small stream in Georgia. The foot-long object, perhaps a one-of-a-kind discovery in North America, was carved from lizardite, a greenish 
serpentine rock found in Asia and the Americas, all right? Not just Asia, all right? Pay attention to that. Found here in the Americas too. Attempt at determining when the soil at the extraction site was last exposed to sunlight with thermal luminescent testing procedures were thwarted because researchers determined the soil had been disturbed. These remains a small section of an unknown stranded material still attached to the sword, which may be suitable for radiocarbon dating together with select areas of surface accretions that may produce helpful information. Less uncertain are the fine shape and many symbolic images which resemble jade artifacts from the Shia. Right? Who's the Shia or the Shi people, huh? Who's the Shi? The Olmec, right? 2000 BC, 1600 BC and the Shang. What's the connection with the Shang and Olmec too? I got future videos on this, guys, all right? 1600 BC to 1040 and Sioux dinasties, 1000 BC. The Georgia source dragon figure spanning a portion of the top of the blade is typically Shang, as is the feathered crown, all right? A feathered crown dragon, come on, that's Quetzalcoatl. You guys see how they hijack in it? Dodge the hijack big time, all right? A feathered serpent, a dragon, a feathered with a feathered crown. That's from here. It's a grotesque face mask of Tawati on the guard and handle of the sword. Hoth <laughs> first appeared during the Leon Su culture, 3400 BC, but it is more commonly found during the Shang and Su periods. The Tawati, a glutinous ogre mask, is a motif commonly found in Chinese ritual articles. All right, now they're going to call it a ogre mask. I'm going to show you what it really is. All right, we're talking about the wear jaguars, the Olmec wear jaguars. They're literally trying to deny it originally being from here like totally they're just trying to definitely because of what it looks like they're saying this has to be a chinese typically consisting of somorphic mask a zoomorphic mask zoomorphic mask there you go that's the omic red jaguar all right so before we continue i just wanted to show you guys examples of what i'm talking about when they're talking about zoomorphic all right or a grotesque ogre mask they're literally trying to get, take the credit away from the Olmec or anybody here in America of the possible makers of that Chinese sword that they found there in Georgia. All right, so take a good look at these masks, figurines, these jade masks. This is all from here. This is ain't from China. All these are from here. All right. This is all Olmec. Olmec wear Jaguar serpentine mask. You've probably seen this one on the cover of my Black Panther video. I'm going to go back to the book and we're going to look at these swords. The dominant presence on the Georgia piece of Shang era diagnostics plus the similarity of the tattoo to the pigeons of the Mesoamerican Olmec Ware Jaguar, that's what I was just showing you, suggests a time frame for the swords manufacture and when it arrived in the peach state. The similarity of Chinese Olmec mythology and symbolism has been the subject of scholarly debate for more than a hundred years. This is what I'm talking about, guys. I'm going to have a future video on this. There's a deep history in Asia with the Olmec. I'm going to show you guys that. It's not me saying it. They've been debating it for 100 years. It is perhaps no coincidence that Mexico's Olmec culture appears about 1500 BC during the beginning of China's Chang Dynasty. It marked the beginning of the Chinese Bronze Age, resulting in ornate metal work, including chariots and weaponry. The first Chinese script appears at this time along with extensive public works projects, all indicators of a sophisticated and advanced culture. Yeah, we brought that over there. It was also a time in Chinese culture when jade was more valuable than gold to become the material of choice for exquisitely formed ceremonial goods. Likewise, with the Olmec elite who mined jade deposits located on Doris in Guatemala, you guys got to understand that we're talking about resources when we're talking about jade. This is where they were getting it mostly from, over here in the Americas. Where all those jade artifacts that they made in China, where did they can't get the jade from? A lot of it was coming from ancient America. They were coming here. We were giving it over there. We're trading. Again, it may not be coincidental that Olmec, during their middle formative period, 900 BC to 300 BC, mastered the difficulties of shaping and drilling jade, a stone so hard that it cannot be worked with steel tools. Do you guys hear that? How did the Olmec do it? with abrasive materials into small ornamental and emboldened pieces. Chinese Olmec art parallels are quite telling. The likely introduction of Chinese concepts concerning rulership, social stratification, together with religion and religious symbolism could have altered the cultural destiny and mythological beliefs of the Olmec and later Mesoamerican groups 
perhaps even Plains Indians residing north of the Rio Grande River. Now, this is what they found in Georgia. You see? The guy right here, that's a weird jaguar. This is Olmec. This is from the Olmec. This is Mesoamerican, most likely. All right? They, of course, we already know Mesoamericans were in Georgia. That's a fact. They found Maya stuff there already. So there was trade going on, even if this was coming from Olmec. These are kind of, a lot of them are the same people that were living there, trading, you know, going back and forth. But this is not Chinese. It just looks so-called Chinese. This is what I'm talking about. You can easily mistake many of the Olmec artifacts for being Chinese or from Asia if you didn't know that they were Olmec. But because a lot of this stuff was found in Olmec sites, of course they're going to say, well, they can't say it's Chinese, right? But this was found in Georgia. So they're like, oh yeah, that's Chinese. But it's not. That's a weird jaguar. Let's go back real quick. That's a weird jaguar. This is all Olmec. Olmec stone. Weird jaguar. Talk about Black Panther. That's what we're talking about. Weird jaguar. The Black Panther. And you see his fangs and his teeth. Going back to the book. Same thing. But how did the sword get to Georgia, right? So they want to and say it's Chinese or Dutch to hijack. Examples illustrating the geographic extent of this cultural diffusion were flat and cylindrical printing seals, a technology that first appeared in Mesoamerican artifact record with the Olmec. In China, printing seals first materialized at the same time during the Shang Dynasty by 800 BC. The seals were being used throughout northern South America, some 1,700 miles south from the Olmec heartland, and an equal distance north to the Adena culture, all right? That's in the Ohio Valley. I told you the Ohio is an important place too. And when we're talking about ancient people and ancient trade, the Ohio, the heart of it all. Not only did this printing technology arrive there, but so did Mesoamerican art. In an unpublished research project on the Andina tablet, this author found stylistic duplicates of the unique center vertical element representing the world tree at the lake Chalco region south of what is now Mexico City and at Veracruz on the Gulf Coast. Arrival of seals at the beginning of the transformational mound building Adena culture, along with other evidence too numerous to include here, indicates that an influential Mesoamerican group entered the region and impacted the cultural destiny of local population. Returning to Georgia in 1685, Charles de Rochefort, in his chronicles regarding the Appalachites, who occupied the lands of South Eastern America during the 17th century, writes, all right, this is very interesting because we just read Charles Rochefort's account of the Appalachians with the Moors and the Huguenots, with the so-called English uh, refugees that were Sephardic Moorish in ancestry, right? That was the same guy. So we're going to read his account on something else. It says these Appalachians boast that they had propagated certain colonies a great way into Mexico, and they showed to this day a great road by land by which they affirmed that their forces marched into those parts. The inhabitants of the country upon their arrival gave them the name Tlatuici, which signifies mountaineers or highlanders. This people, Appalachians, have a communication with the Sea of the Great Gulf of Mexico or New Spain by means of river. The Spaniards have called this river Rio del Espíritu Santo, the Mississippi River. So they continue talking about the ancient navigation uh, skills and trade routes that the ancient americans had in, in this chapter so we already got videos on that make sure to catch those as well i just wanted to show you that they found this in georgia all right they're trying to say it's chinese but this looks just like the weird jaguars of the omic culture all right that's the hijack continuing here waking up with analog unearthed enough a prehistoric burial ground georgia 1888 an interesting discovery, unearthing of a prehistoric burial ground on Broad River from the Elberton, Georgia Star. There is a point on the old Davenport Place, now the property of R.K. Reeves of Athens, between Martins and Jones Ferries, where a bend in the river forms a complete horseshoe. During the big free shot last summer, the river for the first time broke over this barrier, and its ranging waters removed the earth to a depth of several feet after the stream had subsided and returned to its original channel. It was discovered that the waters had exposed to view an aboriginal burial ground. 
and a space of several acres was thickly strewn with human bones and all manner of stone and clay implements such as battle axes, all right, battle axes, arrowheads, pipes, pottery, etc. Many of them were in a perfect state of preservation and of peculiar design. The hands on the place collected quantities of these curiosities, but the strangest part of the discovery is that all the skeletons on earth were of giants, all right, giants, being persons of enormous stature. Some of them were perfect, so we learn. It is believed that they belonged to the race of mound builders that inhabited this land even before the Indians and of whose existence no history remains. They have doubtless slept in their graves for centuries. No one had any idea of the existence of this old burial ground until it was exposed by the high water, all right? So many things they can find here in the Americas. And again, they never told us about any of this right continue says an extinct race with skulls three feet in length ohio 1881 an extinct race with skulls three feet in length the durango record says the following extracts from a letter received by mr charles newman of this city will be found of great interest detailing as they do the discovery of the most remarkable prehistoric remains ever yet unearthed that there were giants in those days can no longer be doubted a skull measuring three feet in length, three feet in length, testifying to their existence among the prehistoric people who once inhabited the valley of the San Juan River. Mr. Newman reports the writer of the letter, Mr. Carpenter, to be a reliable man, and he will avail himself of his offer and take charge of the remains which will be removed to Durango at an early day. Farmington is situated about 50 miles south of Durango at the confluence of the Animas and San Juan rivers, and the discovery was made within three miles of town. The following is the letter detailing the particulars of the discovery. And it says here, Farmington, New Mexico, March 2nd, 1881. Charles Newman, Esquire. Dear Sir, I found yesterday the tomb of an Indian, whom I think, by the very thick skull, to have been a man. The skull was by measure three feet long by two feet wide. It was walled in by a mud wall on the east and north and by stone wall of the room on the other sides. The head of the skeleton was toward the north. The legs had been doubled up on the chest. The bones were thick but short and so far decayed that on being taken out they crumbled to pieces except those of the vertebrae and the bones of the leg in juxtaposition with the left side of the body. Opposite the elbow were two stone vessels, one a black, scaly, oblong body which convex bottom and flaring edge at the mouth and would hold about half a gallon. The other is a highly painted, in fact artistically finished mug or cup with handle on one side, though the latter was broken in the center. Otherwise, the cup is in good preservation. It measures four inches high, three and a quarter inches at the top and four and a quarter inches at the base. This cup contained wheat, which, though decayed and white, is readily recognized by the most careless observer. The other vessel probably contained water, as I could not find anything else but sand and dirt with which it was filled. All right, again, they're finding giants, all right? We continue waking up with analog. Mound excavations in Ohio. So it's here, American Antiquities. In Belmont County, Ohio, about half a mile from the river ohio one of the ancient mounds has recently been opened and penetrated this mound was 40 feet diameter at the base 16 feet high and flat at the top bearing upon it large trees with marks of a succession of groves which had decayed the fifth strantum in this mound consisted of several layers of human bones laid traversely in a great mass of decayed matter five or six inches thick these bones when exposed to the air would molder away although they seemed solid when taken up the toe and fingernails were neatly entire the hair long fine and of a dark brown color and by letting the dirt dry and brushing it off it would bear to be combed and straightened out under the bones were flints one spear heads suitable to be inserted into the end of a long pole 
and some pieces of iron two or three feet long, a kind of cut and trust sword in their make. Their handles were ornamented with rings or ferules of silver and lead, on which were the representations of terrapins and birds, and had also various triangular, rectangular, circular, and elliptical figures made with great mathematical exactness. All right, so they're finding these swords and all these bones in the mound with all these designs, right? Ancient swords made of iron. So it's your Washington letter, Arizona, 1902. Special correspondence. Workmen employed in tearing out the inside of the White House. The other day, unearthed. Deep down, under the basement, all right? Under the White House, all right? Under the basement, a portion of a human skeleton. The mysterious discovery was made while the laborers were excavating a sub-cellar below the floor of the basement for the new heating apparatus. After going down about 10 feet, a massive stone vault was encountered. A stone vault was encountered. They found 10 feet down, listen, in the White House. It proved to be what was apparently the foundation walls of an old house that had evidently stood on the spot where the White House was afterwards erected. It will be remembered that the land upon which the White House and adjacent public buildings stand is made land, developed in its present condition by filling in and grading. In this same excavation was found an immense oven embedded in the stone wall, and in close proximity to the oven were found the bones. The workmen believed they had unearthed an ancient tomb. All right, an ancient tomb under the White House. All right, so we're not done. We actually got another report on this. It's in more detail. Okay, let's read this one. Okay, it says, A gruesome find. Skeleton is unearthed under the White House by workmen. Strenuous effort made to keep the matter a secret. The bones are found in close proximity to old oven. Workmen employed in tearing out the inside of the White House unearthed deep down under the basement a portion of a human skeleton. Strenuous efforts have been made to keep the discovery a secret, pending a careful investigation. The workmen have been cautioned not to discuss the subject, and most rigid regulations have been adopted to prevent persons not actually employed in the work from entering the building. Even clerks and messengers belonging to the executive force are excluded under the existing order. The mysterious discovery was made while the laborers were excavating a sub-cellar below the floor of the basement for the new heating apparatus. After going down about 10 feet, a massive stone vault was encountered. It proved to be what was apparently the foundation walls of an old house that had evidently stood on the spot where the White House was afterwards erected. It will be remembered that the land upon which the White House and adjacent public buildings stand is made land developed to its present condition by filling in and grading. In this same excavation was found an immense oven embedded in the stone wall, and in close proximity to the oven was found the bones. The workmen believed they had unearthed an ancient tomb. All right, they're finding bones under the White House. Continuing, we got a wonderful cave in Virginia, 1852. Besides other things developed, by the opening of the canal to Buchanan is a hither latent talent for hoaxing the unsuspecting public. Not long since we had a detailed account through the rich times of the discovery near Buchanan of a wonderful cave with stone crosses marked with mysterious hieroglyphics, an iron chest containing strange coin, and a skeleton seated thereupon keeping watch and ward. Next, a correspondent of the Finn Castle paper told of the unearthing of an ancient and exquisitely wrought statue, supposed to have been left by some superior but extinct race once inhabiting this country. Lastly, the Stanton Spectator has an account of the digging up somewhere in the same productive region of a brass cannon. The Spectator thinks it was found rather too near that cave. What shall we have next? All right, so they didn't debunk anything, so I guess they were trying to debunk this and call it like, you know, a hoax, but they didn't really say anything. They're just claiming. So why so many newspapers from different towns, different people be writing about things they're finding, you know, to make it up? It makes, you know, no sense. It's too many accounts. It's too many stories. And this one alone had three of them. And they're like, man, it can't be true. But I'm glad he shared this so we can see that even 
the other newspapers are like, hey, what's going on? All these fines. Has to be a hoax. All right, continue. Uh, in this book, Unearthing Ancient America, The Lost Sagas of Conquerors, Castaways, and Scoundrels. Continue on chapter one of this book. We're talking about the ancient Michigan solar eclipse tablets now by David Allen Dill. On September 3rd, 1896, a slate tablet was unearthed at what is now called Roland Township, Isabella County in Michigan. Ironically, an artifact that gives evidence of old world visitors who predated Columbus by more than a thousand years was found in a county that was named for Columbus' own benefactress, Queen Isabella of Spain. The slate tablet has been categorized as fake by authoritative archaeologists. It nonetheless possesses internal evidence that dates a previously unknown and unwanted community of Egyptian Christian Gnostic Coptic mound builders who created thousands of slate, copper, clay, and stone artifacts, not to mention considerable collection of earthworks. All right, that's the hijack. America is a true old world. Remember, these people are coming with an out of Africa theory. Much has been written about this Coptic connection, first by Henriette Mertz in her 1980 book, The Mystic Symbol, and later by this author, investigator, in many articles and research papers. Our conclusions came from slightly different points of reference, but we agreed on the basic fact that Coptic Christians were in North America around the 4th century AD. Regardless of academic and professional disbelief, the Michigan mound builders were called Talegewi, by the Leni Lenapi, otherwise known as the Delaware Indians, and that name is certainly Hebrew. In Hebrew, Tel means a hill or a mound, Tel E plural, and Gu Y signifies my nation or nations. So Tel Gewi in Hebrew indicates mound nations, and that is what they were. The Coptic people merely moved in with the previous Old World inhabitants who were all a bit like them, people of the book. I just want to read what it says here. All right, so this is one of the tablets they found this is like a photocopy of a picture they had it says several calendrical tablets dated to heretical christian refugees in fifth century north america were recovered from michigan's indian mounds all right so dodge the hijack when they're talking about christian refugees so-called christians they don't know that from looking at this tablet that it was christian refugees they add in that part but this is what they're finding in the michigan indian mounds it says, early in 1991, Evan Hansen of Barrow, Utah, sent me a Xerox copy of a single page from a book in the Edson Howard collection, showing the largest of the so-called Michigan tablets, excavated from the state's numerous mounds beginning in the 1840s. It showed a particular artifact in plate 37, reverse of 36 from page 33, the previous page 38, had the reverse side of the same plate, shown an apparent rendering of the Old Testament flood, a common theme found throughout the tablets identified as plate 36 black slate eisenhower collection subtitled roland township isabella co michigan september 3rd 1896 an ocean migration 1600 years ago must have been tortuous which is perhaps why so many depictions of the flood of noah are found among the michigan artifacts having recently endured such a crossing themselves so they're adding conjecture when they're talking about all people came they find in the flood and the tablets that doesn't mean necessary that people had to come that's why they're depicting it hansen's guess that the particular artifact in question represented a meteor he believed was responsible for the biblical deluge what are meteors according to the 1828 webster's dictionary for dragon definition number two a meteor a comet is a fiery serpent a dragon dracon i saw something told together different however a solar eclipse panel I had previously deciphered fundamentally similar imagery in New Mexico at a place known as Hidden Mountain, where I was able to coax a very specific reference from a Hebrew inscribed boulder. September 15, 107 BC, the earliest recorded date in North American history. So archaeoastronomy was not something new to me when I saw the Michigan artifact. All right, so he's talking this, a solar eclipse panel. That's what he's saying it is. Continuing, the person says, however, it is only one representative of a larger body of related artifacts. So that's not the only tablet they found there uncovered all over Michigan and neighboring areas found during a period from about 1840 to 1910. These ancient artifacts must be considered and fairly evaluated with an open mind. Of course, there have been cases of fraud in all areas of archaeology, all right, not just here in America. There even may be some cases of fraud among the Michigan relics, but good investigative science should be applied, not dogma, 
not disdain before investigation. Now, people are trying to say this is a fraud, but if you look at it closely, right, I'm going to show you something we actually gone over before in an old video. Something they found in the Mississippi Mounds, and this is official stuff they have found, declared to be official, not a hoax. All right, so I'm going to bring you back to this video real quick just to corroborate what I'm saying. I can show you guys, and this is official discovery. We have a great video on the Mississippi Valley ancient civilized land, right? As it says here, make sure to check this video out. We show what they found, the tablets they found over there in this area of North America. And it's almost similar to what they found with the Michigan tablets. And this is not declared a hoax. And this part of the video, about 36 minutes in, we're talking about the Mound Builders, their works and relics by Stephen D. Keat, Ph.D., He's a member of the Antiquarian Society, Oriental Society, Fellow of American Association of Sciences, member of the Victoria Institute, also of Society, the Ethnography member, and all these others, right? Historical Society of Virginia, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Davenport Academy of Science, editor of American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal, all right? So he's very prominent. This is what he's going to show us right here. These are some of the hieroglyphics they found on their tablets here in Mississippi. Here, another example, plate two, it says here, characters duplicated on the sandstone tablet. Again, this is coming out of Mississippi. And then we got the Davenport tablet right here, as you guys can see. And look at all these uh, hieroglyphics and writing. And see people kind of gathered together here, holding hands, people uh, laying down or dead. This is the Davenport tablet and the uh, Michigan tablet side by side. You see some of the uh, characters and stuff. You can almost see them here. This ain't declared a hoax, so why would this be declared a hoax? You know, it's just because it doesn't fit their narratives and it wasn't found by them, so they can kind of throw it off. All right, so just a comparison. To me, it's very similar almost. All right, so make sure to catch this video. Entirely, it's only 47 minutes long. That ain't long. Really good information in this video. We continue waking up with analog. Prehistoric city unearthed in Tennessee. It's coming out of Idaho, 1890. This here, an interesting bit of news comes from Mineral Bluffs in the Copper region of Polk County, Tennessee. Announcing that laborers have unearthed a prehistoric city in that vicinity. The first discovery was that of an ancient stone wall, which the workmen traced for one mile. Remnants of dwelling and pottery were also found. An extensive mining operator from the scene of the discovery and who has visited the buried cities of Arizona recognizes parallel characteristics revealed in Tennessee. The work of excavation will be continued. The improvements and industries of the age are uncovered many hidden secrets of the ancients. All right, many secrets of the ancients here in America. Even in Chicago last week, numerous re relics of Indian manners and customs were unearthed. Scientific press, all right, look what they're finding here in prehistoric cities in Tennessee, just like the ones buried in Arizona, the ones we already went over in previous parts. And we continue here waking up with analog because we're just talking about the land of milk and honey. As it says here, prehistoric beehive found amazing discovery by workmen engaged in a stone quarry, a discovery that has attracted considerable attention and speculation was made recently at the quarry of the Missouri River Stone Company a mile south of Atchison, Kansas. The quarry is on the western or Kansas bluff of the Missouri River. The area of the company's operations had to be extended by reason of increase of orders for rip-wrapped stone and 100 feet of ground in length by 25 inches width was denuded of the primeval forest and the earth above the rock averaging about 18 feet in depth scraped off. After the rock had been reached, a hole of about 15 feet in depth was drilled into it by a steam drill. Then, explosives were emptied into the hole and tamped down and a fuse attached. After all this, there was a great blast and a great upheaval of rock. When the workmen went to ascertain the results of the blast, they discovered a great cavity in the original rock that, as they think, had been many years ago a great beehive. There were no bees. But they account for that by the dust on the floor of the cavity. You see this was a large beehive? That there was honey there and palatable honey is vouched for by all the workmen. The cavity in the rock was a perfect beehive and in its congeries of hexagonal cells deferred in no particular from the architecture of busy bees of prehistoric as well as present times. Whether this honey is the product of bees of this age 
which had found some opening through the mountain of earth above the rock's cavity, or whether it is honey that has been sealed in the everlasting rock since the flood. All right, since the flood, this is old, is a debatable question, but the consensus of opinion gives to it the title of prehistoric honey. Again, we're just talking about the land of milk and honey. Right above this, we got another discovery. A petrified beehive has been found near Grass Valley, California, with honey and bees all petrified. It was found 75 feet below the surface in a log two and a half feet in diameter, 40 feet long. The Grass Valley National says the beehive is no matter of fancy, but a pure demonstration. Before us is a sample of the comb full of honey, all petrified, all petrified, okay? Finding honey all over the promised land, the real promised land america is the true old world the land of milk and honey all right we got this article coming out of virginia 1880 it says here the christian at work has made the marvelous discovery after reading the inscriptions on the obelisk designed for central park that the original home of the egyptians was in yucatan or mexico all right after reading the inscriptions on the obelisk he concluded, right? The one they put in Central Park. This is a newspaper from 1880, Virginia. They're telling you that the original home of the Egyptians, so-called Egyptians, was in Yucatan or Mexico. This is the true old world. They reached the Nile by traveling up the Pacific coast of North America, crossing the Bering Strait, traversing Asia, and landing in Egypt. All right. That's exactly what we read about the Maya going over to Asia first and then over to so-called Egypt, that colony they built over there. We presume there is some mistake about this. We suspect what the Christian at work meant to say was that the Egyptians got here from the moon on an arrow light thrown up during a volcanic eruption. We hope to hear that this is the fact. All right, so they're kind of making fun of it because it's hard to believe. But did you guys know that the Obelisk said that? Why haven't they told us that? Hmm, something we're going to definitely look into, of course. Shout out to the brother for sharing this little article right here. All right, we're going to end it right there. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, part. We got a lot more discoveries to show you. I got a lot of books talking about these things. And Waking Up With Analog has a lot more articles we're going to be going into, okay? Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. Pura vida. Wow.